Everybody, it's the War Hipster here. Yes, I'm not deranged. I promised. I'm, I'm still have my mind. Yes, I'm here, and I am here to review the new Codex Chaos Demons for all of you. Sent to me early by Games Workshop. So a massive, massive thank you to them for doing that. That just has absolutely made my year. I'm, ah, uh, I've been poring over this for the last couple of weeks, and. I, let me tell you, it's everything I could ever have hoped for and more. We have some feedback, but who wouldn't, right? We've got to be a nice balanced review. That's what you get at War Hipster Towers. This book is pretty cool. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be breaking it down over a series of videos because there is a lot to talk about in Codex Chaos Demons. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be doing a video of a general overview which is this one which is what you're watching and then we're gonna have specific reviews slash deep dive videos into each of the gods Korn, Nurgle, Slanesh and Zinch. So make sure that you are subscribed to the channel that you like this video and that you let me know your thoughts on Codex Chaos Demons. You want to be subscribed because you want to be able to see the spicy hot takes that I have Trust me, I really love this book. You're going to love it. If you're a Demons fan, you're going to want to watch all of these videos. I promise you. So with that in mind, it's time to don your dark cowl, to mark your skin. Don't, don't do that. But <laughs> it's time, minions, to dive into Codex Chaos Demons. Get ready, because it's going to be amazing. It is an age where the darkest dreams of humanity are surpassed daily by the stark horrors of their reality. The galaxy overflows with nightmares made flesh. Yet, even in these dread times, there are powers of such inimitable malevolence that the mere knowledge of their existence must be suppressed, lest it shatter the resolve of all mankind. But innocence is not the same as safety. Through the tattered veil of the real, from amidst the roiling madness and infinite corruption of the warp, the demons of chaos spell forth to claim the souls of the ignorant and the dreadfully enlightened alike, and to plunge all of reality into final and everlasting damnation. First of all, as is always the case, the art in this book is top notch. The book's narrative section at the beginning is written in such a way that it's just so in keeping with the book you are reading. It's so cool. Here's how it starts. You have opened the book already. You have read too much. You have no choice now but to press on, to learn of the roiling other space of the warp, of its malevolent denizens, and of the dark gods of chaos that compete to rule over its infinite and insane depths. If you are fortunate, you may bind these demons to your will and lead them to conquest. For a time, at least. This is everything I could have ever wanted in a demon's codex. The background is fleshed out, there's some fantastic stories in here and short narrative pieces that are both scary and awesome. So kudos GW, you made me sh** my pants. Good job! Secondly, the book is laid out really nicely in an order that makes sense. It might not be the biggest of news, but it's useful and it's a feather in the old cap because some books are laid out weirdly, like the old Demons Codex, which was to put it mildly, not good. But this book is in order. It's simple to navigate around and that makes the practical use of this book top notch. As in, 
getting it out and using it, like the bluff old traditionalist that I am. Now then, in brief, let's talk about the general overall matched play rules for the codex, because I have some thoughts here. We're not going to go into super fine detail for each god in this video, those will come throughout the rest of the week where we take a deep look at each god. But for now, what are the changes to demons? Firstly, there are no secondaries in this book. Um... Honestly, I don't know why they aren't in this book, but they aren't. You get them in the Warzone thingamajigsy book, so tournament players, use the book you already have. It's a little disappointing to not see them in this one, so everything is contained in one place, but hey, the Grand Tournament rules say you can only use the secondaries in the Grand Tournament book, so let's hope that doesn't change. There are no faction traits anywhere to be found except in the Army of Renown for Belakor. Yes, Slanesh doesn't have Advance and Charge, Korn doesn't have Reroll Charges, Zinch doesn't have Plus One to Saves, and Nurgle doesn't have Disgustingly Resilient. Now I get them losing those as some of them are downright powerful, especially when you take into account what has happened to the data sheets and the raw stat lines of everything, but no, you don't get these classic abilities anymore. They are gone. Forget about them. Don't plan for them. Don't include them in your scheming. Just don't do it. Because it's not going to help you. Also, pull one out for summoning. It's gone. Sorry. Actually, I am very sorry about this because summoning is cool, but no one does it. Apart from me at that one fun and fluff that one time. Or splitting horrors. That was a thing technically summoning but not really anyway okay so what do they get right so we have a few things to cover off here firstly we have detachment abilities the keyword legiones demonica is hard to say for my poor mouth so i'll refer to it as demonica demonica detachments gain demonic allies demonic legions and demonic relics and troops gain the objective secured ability. Demonic Legions basically does two things. If you have only Demonica detachments and include any greater demon units, one of those must be your Warlord. You're not limited to one per detachment or one per army, so if you want to run multiple greater demons, you still can. Huzzah! This applies unless your army also includes Belakor, who can be your Warlord instead though more on that later. For each greater demon unit included in a detachment, you can include one herald unit with the same allegiance keyword in that detachment without taking up a slot, which is amazing. You can take three greater demons and three heralds all in the same battalion detachment without having to spend valuable CP on more detachments. This is a big, big win in terms of army building. It's just really, really good. Extra HQs. Although points, hmm, that's a question. Demonic Relic says that if you have a Demonic Warlord, you can give one Demonica character model from your army a Relic. I don't know if this is exempt from the rules around paying CP in Grand Tournament games for Warlord traits and Relics these days, as it specifically calls out you can take a Relic, but not a Warlord trait. Whereas each individual book in here says you may give a Warlord trait and then describes the Relics as here are the rules for these. It's a little confusing, but there you have it. It's a thing. In addition, each one of these god sections, they have an additional stratagem that lets you take an additional relic. So I'm guessing it's just one relic. It's calling out that you can take a relic. It, that's, that's a thing that it's doing. Demonic allies. You can take demons as 25% of your power rating in any Chaos army, including World Eaters, Thousand Sons, Death Guard, and Emperor's Children for their respective god. And this is pretty cool, as the demons gain the Agent of Chaos keyword so it doesn't break your Chaos army, and it specifically calls out those traitor legions, so that's awesome. If Belakor is around though, this has no effect. Silly old Belakor. Next up, we have datasheet abilities. Now this is where your spice is starting to get hot. You have the four keywords, Korn, Zinch, Nurgle, and Slanesh. 
This comes up as important as the keywords Legiones Demonica becomes Legione. See, it's a mouthful. Legiones Demonica Corn, for example. Now, onto the good stuff. Malefic weapons. Before this book, demons had a lot of stuff on their data sheets. That was like, if you may use this weapon and make a single attack with it, or you may make four additional attacks with this, looking at you, Keeper of Secrets. Now, they have malefic weapons. This is a fixed number of attacks with a malefic weapon that you always make in addition. Unless, otherwise specified, malefic weapons are never affected by effects or abilities that allow models to make additional attacks or abilities that would add, subtract from, or improve their characteristics in any way. Now correct me if I'm wrong, but this would suggest that malefic weapons aren't affected by things like Armor of Contempt. This is big. If that is true, I would assume it is based on the wording. This is a great change as these weapons are seldom used, but now they are always used. But similarly, you can't really buff them up, which is good stuff, really good stuff. And you can't affect them negatively. I'm coming for you, power armored desserts. Now let's move on to the least confusing part of the book. Demonic Invulnerability. Demons now get a new save, and it's very simple. It's not a normal save characteristic, it's a demonic save. They get two, one for ranged weapons, and one for combat weapons. It can't be modified, it can't be removed, it can't be tampered with, it can't be buffed. It is always what it says it is on the page. No cover, no AP, no removing invulnerable saves. No minus one to saves, no plus one to saves, no ways to modify it at all. And I don't have to worry about your AP or cover or you removing the only flimsy protection that I once had. It's great. There's no way to modify it at all either. So what it says on the page is always what it is. I know I've already said that, but it's worth reiterating. No plus one to save here or anything to remember. It's just always on the page. It's always on the page. It's simple. Moving on. Demonic Terror is an aura. While an enemy unit is within six inches of this unit, and that's all the units in the book, they all have this, subtract one from that enemy unit's leadership characteristic and subtract one from any combat attrition tests taken for that enemy unit. So this doesn't sound impressive, but my interpretation of it is that it stacks because it says within six inches of this unit and not any unit. Leadership is also one of those few things that you can still stack modifiers up. So it leads me to believe that if you are within six inches of say, three units of blood letters, then you are minus three to your leadership and minus three to any combat attrition tests taken for that enemy unit. Now, again, this might not be particularly impressive and I also might be wrong, but here's why I think this stacks because well, we have Manifestation. Manifestation. During deployment, you can set up this unit in the warp instead of setting it up on the battlefield. If you do so, then in the reinforcement step of one of your movement phases, you can set up this unit anywhere on the battlefield that is more than 9 inches away from any enemy models, or more than 6 inches away from any enemy models, and wholly within 6 inches of a friendly warp locus model that was on the battlefield at the start of your turn. If that warp locus model has an allegiance keyword, C left, so you know, corn, zinch, nurgle, slanesh, that unit being set up can only use this ability if it has the same allegiance keyword. If every unit from your army has the legiones demonica keyword, then in the reinforcement step of one of your movement phases, you can instead set up this unit anywhere on the battlefield with one of the following restrictions wholly within your deployment zone and more than three inches away from any enemy models. Three inches. Neither wholly within your deployment zone nor within your opponent's deployment zone and more than a number of inches away from each enemy unit equal to the current leadership characteristic of that enemy unit to a minimum of three inches and a maximum of nine inches. Okay, this might be upsetting, but remember, 
Faction traits like advance and charge and rerollable charges are gone and they do not exist anywhere in this book. There is no way to do that. So this is not in conjunction with those and it is going to require really good positioning and tactical play to be able to reap the benefits of this in the mid table. Often where there is more action and a lot less terrain. It sounds powerful and it is, but it's hard to pull off. So what does this all mean? Basically, you want a ton of characters for the warp locus so that your demons can appear around said character six inches away from the enemy. Unless you can stack a bunch of leadership debuffs to get even closer. Basically, a three inch deep strike isn't happening in the midboard that often, but it could if my interpretation of the leadership rules is accurate, but I could be wrong. So take it with a pinch of salt. And I swear to Bellacor, I hope it is this way because demons need a little bit of help and leadership is a great way to do that. Kill one model in a unit that is surrounded by demons, minus six to your leadership and minus six to combat attrition. That's how we get ya. You could of course have to be surrounded by multiple demons units so that's incredibly hard to do, but that would be cool. Finally, we have the Warp Storm and this is good. It's also bad. It's also great, it's also terrible, and it's also awesome, all at once, just like you would expect. If every unit from your army has the Demonica keyword, excluding Agent of Chaos or unaligned models, at the start of each battle round, you can make a Warp Storm roll. Roll 8d6 for each 4+, gain one Warp Storm point. You can gain more by doing some things like a psychic power here or a unit ability there, but otherwise, that's it. You can only do this if every unit is Legiones Demonica. You then spend these in the battle round it was generated. You can't use each effect more than once per battle round, but you can, unless otherwise specified, use it multiple times in the game. Any spent points are deducted from your total. And at the end of each battle round, unspent Warp Storm points are lost, unless you have an ability that specifically says you can keep some, such as a Warlord trait here, or a Psychic Power there, etc, etc. Now all in all, you have a bunch of effects that you can spend them on. Without going into too much detail here, all of them are good. Some of them are amazing. You have the undivided list, and then one list for each god. You can use the god specific ones on detachments that are made up purely of that god's devotees. You can't use them on units in mixed demons detachments. So Bellacor's lot can't use the god specific ones, for example, if you're taking the army of Renan. Predictably, the best ones cost the most warp storm points. So for example, Dark Invigoration. For five warp storm points, use this effect at the start of the morale phase. One model in each Legiones Demonica unit from your army can regain up to D3 lost wounds. If every model in that unit has a wounds characteristic of 1, that unit instead can be replenished. When a unit is replenished, you can return D3 destroyed models to that unit with their full wounds remaining. Each returned model no longer counts as having been destroyed for the purposes of morale tests this turn, and each unit can only be replenished once per turn. This is great. In fact, it's really, really good, but it does cost five Warp Storm points. And on average, on eight dice, you are rolling four, four pluses. So this is where being able to keep some over from your previous round or generating more in game is super valuable. Similarly, we have some powerful ones, such as for Corn, we have Fury of Corn. For four Warp Storm points, Use this effect at the start of the fight phase. Until the end of the phase, add one to the attack's characteristic of Legiones Demonica Corn models from your army. Four Warp Storm points, tons of attacks. It's just really, 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 really good. Or for example, Slanesh, who have Mesmerizing Dance, which again, for four Warp Storm points, use this effect at the start of the fight phase. Until the end of the phase, each Legiones Demonica Slanesh unit from your army that is within engagement range of any enemy units can fight first that phase. Because fight first is no longer a datasheet ability. It is gone. 
Descending Shadow is excellent for minus one to hit in your opponent's shooting phase more than 12 inches away, and Otherworldly Tread is great for ignoring move and charge modifiers, and these are both at three and two Warp Storm points respectively. Ultimately, you've got a reasonably large toolkit now for doing some awesome stuff, which is more complicated than, say, Advance and Charge, as long as you're within six inches of a Slanesh Locust model with a friendly Slanesh unit which, you know, wasn't that easy to begin with, but there you go. They affect your entire army slash detachment unless stated, otherwise making for some really cool choices for a demon's player. These are great and make the army unpredictable to play against, which is just what you want from a demon's army. 10 out of 10. Wouldn't change a thing here. Now you don't get generic stratagems, warlord traits, or relics for demons, so that's a thing. You get the Warp Storm table, and to be quite frank, I am on board. Demons are going to be tough to use well, but if you do, it'll be bonkers and a hilarious good time. Unless, of course, Bellacor is here. I'm skipping a bunch of the book for now because we're going to be doing Corn, Zinch, Nurgle, and Slanesh videos separately because each is awesome and this video needs to not be six hours long. Space out your content. I'm just thinking of you. Why not think of me and hit the subscribe button to see those videos? Okay, Bellacor, the Shadow Daddy himself. His rules and the Disciples of Bellacor are here and have had a cheeky little update. He got better, and the rules got better, and the Army of Renown got better. Let's start with the big man himself. He gained four wounds. <laughs> and he has a demonic save of 4 plus 4 plus. This is massive, as the best way to deal with Bellacor was to take away his invulnerable save, then chip him to death with weight of fire. Now he's tougher and takes longer to kill. And he'll e take even longer to kill because of some more changes, but we'll get to that in a second. His stat line remains the same as it was otherwise, including the degradation of his stats as he gets beaten up. And his weapons are also the same as they were before. Sweeping strike to make two hit rolls instead of one for each attack, and the piercing strike for strength plus four, minus four, d3 plus three damage with no invulnerable saves allowed. Now for his abilities. Shadow form is different. No rerolls to hit are allowed against him as before. He is minus one to hit and minus one to wound, but this has changed to minus one to wound all the time, not just at range. And now, each time a ranged attack is made against this model, subtract one from that attack's damage characteristic to a minimum of one. He gains the demonic rules that we talked about earlier as well, and he is still minus one to leadership and minus one to combat attrition tests on his data sheet as well. So Bellacor now has two auras that add up to minus two to leadership and minus two to combat tr attrition tests. Incredible scenes. His Dark Master aura remains the same of re-roll hit rolls of one for friendly demons. So here's how you can get your characters re-roll ones to hit as well. So Bellacor is a spicy boy still and has gotten even spicier, making him the undisputable Daddy of Shadows. He has also improved because of his psychic discipline, the Noctic Discipline. The Noctic Discipline is mostly unchanged, except now the two best psychic powers in the list don't just affect Disciples of Bellacor units, they affect friendly demons too. Shrouded Step can be used and Wreathed in Shades can be used on friendly Demonica units, so Bellacor is no longer locked to Maledictions and Witchfire if you take him in, say, a Slanesh or Corn army. He's now even more valuable in Mono Demon armies. Ridiculous. Disciples of Bellacor, as mentioned, is here and has fairly similar restrictions and benefits as it had before. No named characters. No god-specific space marines such as plague marines, no demon engines, no greater demons. In addition, we have no chaos marks, no demons and chaos space marines in the same detachment, and you still have to have even numbers of god-specific demons. So you can't add a second corn unit until you've added a Zinch, Slanesh, and Nurgle one as well. However, benefits do now include the ability to take 
a House Corvax Auxiliary Detachment. And you get to keep all the benefits and rules of House Corvax if you do so. The restriction on this is that one night that you can take in your Auxiliary Detachment, if you want to give it a favor of the Dark Gods, it must be Blessings of the Dark Master. Oh no, the best one in the Chaos Knights book. Damn it, whatever will I do? Anyway, the other benefits are all largely the same. You get a page of stratagems as well, and of course, all of the previous demonic abilities discussed at the beginning of the video. So all in all, Disciples of Bellacor has gotten a lot better. Like, it's viable. And of course, Bellacor is still nuts and has gotten even better. So you know, Bellacor forever! Before we discuss Crusade, let's quickly touch on points because there's some curious changes here that make more sense based on the improvements to the individual data sheets, which we're not going into in this video, but will be in each of the God specific videos. But as a general rule, the points have all gone up. In some cases, it feels really harsh, especially as the max unit sizes have gone down. Blood letters, for example, are 130 points for 10 now. You can't take 20. You can't take 30, you can take 10 for 130 points. Now granted, you don't have to pay for the instrument or the icon anymore, they are free. However, before you could take 30 blood letters with an icon and an instrument for 265 points. Now you can take two units of blood letters of 10 for 260 points with icons and instruments. In contrast to that, you used to take them in big units because they unlock stat changes the more you had in the unit. Blood letters, in our example, gained a plus one attack and strength if they charged and plus one to hit if there were more than 20 of them. They now have the plus one attack and strength baked into their stat line and the plus one to hit is gone. But they traded that for plus one toughness, so who knows? We'll get into that in the Book of Corn review and all of the others because it's very, very interesting. Points have gone up, unit sizes have gone down, generally that's the rule of them. Beasts of Nurgle are a max unit size of 3 now, for example, and come in at 80 points a model, which is a huge climb up, but it's entirely justified. <laughs> okay, points aside, which as I say we'll cover in more detail in the upcoming videos, let's talk about Crusade. The great game is awesome. Like, it's just so damn cool, it makes my teeth hurt. That's a good joke, come on. When you create your order of battle, you can start to influence the great game. At the beginning, the gods start with ascendancy points, fixed at 4 for Korn, 3 for Zinch, 2 for Nurgle, and 1 for Sinesh. You then play a bunch of games, 8 to be precise, and after each game you play, each god gains d3 ascendancy points in this order. Korn, Zinch, Nurgle, Sinesh, as in you roll the dice in that order after each game. The god that shares an allegiance with your warlord gains one ascendancy point. If you won the battle, they gain d3 ascendancy points. And if Bellacor was your warlord for that battle, all four gods gain one ascendancy point, or d3 if you won the battle. This sounds like a lot, but it does matter because you then get a benefit for each god based on their position in the great game. I honestly can't explain to you how cool this is. Like, it's really, really, really fun and extremely fluffy. At the end of the eight games, you get even more benefits. And then the game, the great game, begins anew. And it, it just perfectly represents the shifting power and balance in the warp. I really, really want to do this. Does anyone out there want to play a Crusade campaign with me? I'll film it and everything. I promise. Let's do it. You then have your typical character rewards, unit benefits and battle traits, which are all as you would expect by now, fans of Crusade, and of course, a page of Crusade relics. And that's it. It's neat and tidy and fairly simple to work with, which is just a huge benefit for a book as complicated as Demons. This is probably my favorite set of Crusade rules I've read so far, as I read through it all and didn't at any point think it would be a lot of work to do, which sometimes some Crusade rule sets have felt at some point. So, really, really, really cool codex here, both for Matched and for Crusade. Highly recommend. So there you have it, folks. Part one of the 
Codex Chaos Demons review is in the bag. We've just done the overview, as I'm sure you can tell, having stayed with me for the past 30 minutes. And I hope you enjoyed it and found it very useful. I am really enjoying this book and making these videos. It's a lot of fun to do, and I'm just really thankful that I get to be in a position to do this. So make sure you like, make sure you comment, make sure you subscribe, and I will see you all very soon in the next one. Happy Wargaming. If you enjoyed this video, you love the channel, and you want to support me further like these legends and bosses on the screen before you, you can do so. Head to patreon.com forward slash warhipster or head to ko-fi.com forward slash warhipster. Alternatively, you can now become a YouTube channel member by heading to the channel page and clicking on the join button just here, exactly like these awesome folks have done. And if you just want to shoot me a little thanks just because you really love this video, you can click on the thanks button just below this video. Don't forget to share it, like it, comment on it, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. And to make sure you stay up to date, don't forget to click the bell icon. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all very soon in the next one. Happy Wargaming.